so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we are we are virtual from the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum. I'm Namulan Bayer Sehan, and I'm the education director here. We are recording today's program, so you will see a recording button on the top left hand of your screen. And um, we will be using two functions on the chat as well as the Q&A in Zoom if you have any questions throughout the program. We will address those questions at the end of the conversation. We're really excited to be hosting today's program. Um, the exhibition on view is at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum and my colleague, Amy Smith Stewart, who is our senior curator, will be introducing the show as well as today's special guests. The Aldrich Museum is located in Ridgefield, Connecticut and we are the only museum in Connecticut dedicated to contemporary art. We are also a non-collecting institution, so we have consistently new exhibitions on view throughout the year. We will also have the live transcript button open and available for anyone that may need to use our closed captioning over Zoom. So you'll see that at the bottom and it says live transcript. Without further ado, I'm, I'm really delighted to welcome Amy Smith Stewart. Thank you so much for moderating today's conversation, and you can take it away. Thank you, Namilan, and welcome everyone. So excited for this conversation today. Um, I'm again very pleased to introduce two amazing and distinguished creatives, Clarity Haynes and Harag Vartanian. Clarity is a queer feminist New York based artist and writer whose practice centers on the body, queer feminist resistance, and the archive. Her work has been widely exhibited, and she's also written about art for Bomb, The Brooklyn Rail, Hyperallergic, and Art News. Rob Vartanian is the editor in chief and co founder of Hyperallergic. He's also an editor, art critic, curator, and lecturer on contemporary art with an expertise on the intersection of art and politics. Clarity's altar painting series began in 2000 and is based on life-size shrines she composes in her studio. Birth Altar and Altar for Femme Joy are currently on view at the Aldrich in her first museum presentation, Collective Transmission. It inaugurates Aldrich Projects, a new single artist series that spotlights a singular work or a focused body of work by an artist every four months on the museum's campus. The exhibition also is closing soon, Sunday, September 6th. So please, if you haven't seen it yet, come and catch it in its final days. Um, also, you will see if you come to the Aldridge that her works are accompanied by a free limited edition broadsheet that includes color reproductions of the two paintings, surrounded by a collection of thoughts and ideas by people in her Instagram orbit on the color pink and its enduring agency. Um, we will discuss in depth the altar painting's origin story, while also um, Harag will look at historical contemporary references, and hopefully if there's time, we might even end with a brief discussion about the color pink. So um, Harag and Clarity, welcome. I'm very excited for your conversation. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Clarity. Thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. Um, I am really grateful for this um, opportunity, this exhibition, which is the first time that my ultra paintings have been shown without any of my figurative paintings as context. So it's really exciting to really just hone in on this specific body of work. Um, and uh, today I'm also very excited to talk with Hrag about these works. As I remember when I started them, this recent iteration of them in 2019, I showed um, Harag a couple of images on my phone and immediately got this amazing art historical response and all these artists that I hadn't known about from art history um, and got me thinking about my work in new ways. So uh, this is a great opportunity to go further into some of that thinking. Um, and, I, and the image you see on your screen right now is uh, an, a painting I made more than 20 years ago, actually, of my altar. This is when I was living in Philadelphia, and this was actually my altar at the time. And it just occurred to me one day to paint it as, as if it were a still life. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed doing that. And then I kind of forgot about this painting for like 20 years. And then I saw a photograph of it, and I thought, that's what I need to do now. 
So um, for the past few years, I've been having a, a lot of fun constructing altars and painting them. And on the right in this um, photograph, you can see them next to each other, a 2019 painting on the right, um, altar, um, rainbow altar, spring into summer. And then on the left is the one I made, which I now call South Philly altar um, in 2000. So that's the origin story of the altar paintings. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into more about the significance of why the altar and what it, what it all means. It's, it's a personal cosmology and it's a political cosmology. And to me, it, it's an expression of a explicitly queer and feminist spirituality, um, which is a source of a lot of empowerment, I think for me and, and many others. Um, and I do think of the altars as um, portable, like the altar paintings as a kind of portable altar. So once I'm done with the painting, I can take the actual setup down and, and start another one. So, um, yeah. So I'm curious, Rag, to, should I go on to the next slide so, so we can see the, the image that you brought? Sure. Here? So one of the reasons I was dying to have this, and I think the, this conversation, but also Clarity, when Clarity first showed me the, the new series or the newer pa altar paintings and my reaction was, I felt like there was a real interiority to these paintings. And there was like this rich kind of lineage uh, art historically, but they also felt super contemporary. So, you know, uh, of course there's sort of ancient origins of the sort of the trompe l'oeil kind of uh, sort of like this sort of still life, you know, in ancient Rome and Greece. But I immediately started thinking of these 17th century Dutch paintings that were sort of like some of the origins of this and how at the time they also represented, I mean, there's been a lot of art history written about this, this idea of how it's also, it's not just about the perspective and perspectival organization, but there's like an outside inside structure. And I think that's something that, that really spoke to me in terms of your work too, because they represent these sort of personal altars and how these, uh, you know, at that period, this idea of the perspective is sort of thwarted a little and turned on onto the viewer itself, right? And these sort of like different accumulated things uh, are, sort of, are sort of put together. And, and they sort of represent the sort of the material culture of the period as much as anything, which I think is also true of your work. So if you mind going to the next slide. And so here you see another example of a French sort of version of the same thing, where I think this is getting even closer to what you're kind of doing in the way it's organizing, where there's uh, not just art, but personal notes and artifacts and objects that kind of get accumulated into this kind of presentation. Um, but the but the viewer is looking both, you know, knowing that it's sort of a trick of the eye, but it also feels very real and intimate and personal. Um, and of course, then we had a conversation. If you want to go to the next slide, that I that I really loved. Um, oh, here's another example of the same genre, just to kind of give you a sense of that. So if you can go to the next one, that would be great. Yeah. And so now we're in the 19th century, and my first thoughts were thinking of this 19th century iteration of this and the connection. And then you told me you went to PAFA for, to school, which is actually the place I associate with these still lives because they have such a rich connect collection as well as the fact that a number of American artists that worked in this vein actually attended PAFA in the 19th century. So I, I had this vision of you somehow sort of seeing these paintings and sort of making them part of your artistic language um, in this fully integrated way. But, you know, these paintings also came at a time in American history where, you know, they're kind of a little muted. There was a lot of anxiety in, in society at the time. Uh, William Parnett was actually the Secret Service once, you know, was going to try to charge him with counterfeiting money by painting them on painting. So there are all these like elements of kind of history that sort of gets passed on, but also the fact that music is readable, uh, all these different sort of elements that feel very real, but also very much part of a kind of the language of its era, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think is very true of your work. So if you mind sort of just going forward. And here's another example, which I think is even closer to what you're talking, what your work does, because it sort of creates this kind of cosmology of different objects, of different histories. And the histories are very much part of the work, 
right? And it feels like it feels like um, in the same way you're also playing with images within images. Um, and, and in the examples here, there's also this kind of playfulness between this kind of um, the, well, it's also ephemeral. That's also one of the major parts of the work is this ephemerality that's sort of captured. Um, and to me, your work has always said a lot about sort of interior landscapes as much as exteriors and exterior views. And I think this sort of, this, this tradition also very much ties into this kind of interior dialogue and this interior sort of history that kind of continues on, which I think coming to the 20th century and the late part of the 20th century has been very much taken up by queer and feminist sort of artists and others, because we understand that sort of the, the thwarting of the sort of where there's an external and an internal structure that goes on at the same time. And at the same time, it's sort of turned inside out where you know, the private and the public and sort of like rendering this, what should be normally a private moment into a very public display. So like this would be an ephemeral private sort of thing, but it's sort of captured in this kind of way that sort of suggests something much more grand and, um, and, and, and extensive. And I think the next one is Audrey Flack, yes. So this was during the MoMA rehang, um, the recent rehang, this painting was sort of prominently placed um, in the museum near the escalators. And, you know, I didn't even initially think of this when you first showed me your image, but I thought how much this was so similar. Um, because one thing that Audrey Flack told me that I think is so interesting was she said of all the paintings at MoMA at the time, this was probably the one that people can sort of point to and said, say this was perhaps made by a female artist, right? Mm. Which I thought was sort of interesting because it was a very personal, intimate sort of look at some kind of table or placement. And so it also made me think of your work, thinking of how, how the issues of and, and the different elements of identity and gender kind of sort of bring themselves into the work itself. So could a man have painted this perhaps, but I think in, in a traditional sense, people particularly of that era would have assumed that a woman would have painted this. And I think that's something else that I, I think is really relevant. And again, the inter uh, artistic dialogue here with the Leonardo you know, and these other kinds of uh, elements that kind of come in, there's this play between history, right? And the dialogue here feels mu as much of the subject as it is the, the artist, right? And there's this sort of element that sort of brings in and also highlighting things that are often overlooked. Um, so if you wanna continue the next, um, and of course there are a number of artists like Nessa Baines here who have makes these ofrendas, which of course is part of the Mexican tradition of like the day of the dead or these altars. Um, and there, I think this definitely speaks to what you have done in some of your work. Um, because in this case, it's to a, a very famous Mexican actress that also did a number of silent films in Hollywood in the 20s and 30s. But there's sort of this elevating of these sort of personal cosmologies mm -hmm. into a much bigger kind of frame. And I think that's something that, that um, your work, particularly at the Aldrich right now, very much does. Um, particularly using the sort of the framing of this giant heart and, and, the, and these different kinds of forms that have their own kind of meanings. Mm -hmm. And if you want to go to the next one, great. And then the other thing it made me think a lot about was just what artists put in their studios. And here, this was an artist I visited um, last month in, in the Bronx, uh, Shailene Rodriguez. And I was just, I'm always taken by workspaces. And those objects that we keep nearby in order to inspire us and also just that are part of these bigger histories we're talking about. And I, I, I definitely, every time I see one of your altar paintings, I think about, I wonder what she was thinking about or where this came from or what was the journey of this piece of paper or this object. And it becomes like little mini histories that kind of get accumulated. Um, so that was something. And then this past weekend for the final image, I just wanted to mention that I was at the Jack Shaman's The School and noticed how his former partner and business partner, um, Claude Samard, there's like a little altar that was built in the place. And also talking about how we, how we sort of remember people in our lives in many different ways, including through these kind of altars. And in this case, there is this accumulation of things he clearly loved. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that love kind of comes through. And I think, 
these sort of these these trompe l'oeil sort of um, renderings in the case of your work and, and in case of this other heritage and this tradition. And I know yours is a little more painterly and I think it's like very much part of that because I think photography has played a very different role in our culture, um, you know, but I think through that painterliness, there's this kind of creating this kind of fixed, fixed idea and monument like and, and kind of timelessness as a result. And I think altars have a timeless quality, timelessness about them often. And I think in your work, rendering what is otherwise ephemeral into these fixed images, I think is very much part of that tradition. So that's why I was very excited about talking about this because these were all different thoughts that came into my head, thinking about your work. And when I saw the work at the Aldridge recently, I was really excited by that. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit from you, Clarity, thinking about your own art historical references, you know, what you were thinking about when you were creating these. Sure, sure. I, and I just want to say I love this image so much. It actually just feels really emotional and beautiful. Um, and I, I guess it's always there. It's not part of an art show, right? It's just like there in the wall. And I love too the shallow space of it. And it reminds me too of Betty Saar, you know, and her boxes. Right. You know, um, like I feel like altars were a big part of a lot of the like uh, women and feminist artists of the 1970s. Um, including her, you know, and just there's something about the box and that really shallow space um, yeah. is something I do love about. And also a lot of the trompe l'oeil that you showed, um, I thought, because I, I think traditionally still life has a little more space in it, maybe a little more depth. Um, so, so yeah, so here's an example we could go through and just talk about sort of what is in this painting. This is uh, a 2019 painting called Lion Altar summer into fall and it's 58 inches tall and um, there's a lot of different objects in it that have some kind of meaning for example on the table if you look there's a uh, a yellow candle and on each side of the candle are two little sculptures and they were each made by my partner kate hawes who's a sculptor and, and woodworker um, so those two things are very significant um, the, the, the ceramic bowl in the foreground is also made by, um, the man, Norman Bacon, who used to live in the house that we live in upstate. Um, and then if you go up a little bit on the right, uh, there's this kind of painting above the brown floral pattern, a little painting that has black line in it. That's a Fran O'Neill, a small Fran O'Neill painting that she sent me in the mail once. Um, and then I think I have a detail here. We can get a little closer. Um, one item that is in both this and the South Philly altar, which is the first altar painting from 2000, is that beaded um, object to the right, which, which are prayer beads that my friend Catherine gave me many, many years ago. Um, above that is a drawing that I made that I just kind of found that I had saved for some reason. And actually a lot of these objects are things that I just saved and I've had for a long time. Um, the little lion ceramic figure I bought at from a woman named Chris London at Woman Gathering, which was a women's spirituality festival in Northeastern Pennsylvania in 1998. And that was where I first started doing breast portraits um, sort of you know, in public on commission. Um, and I really love her ceramics. And then above that is a card that my friend Laurel True sent me sometime in the 90s. Um, and it's a Venus of Willendorf photograph with her collage that she made around it. And it's a card that opens up in three parts. It's sort of a little um, triptych. It's actually kind of an altar in itself. And then above that is a, a beautiful ceramic piece, which I think was meant to be a necklace made by Julia Elsas, who's a, a great uh, ceramicist living in Brooklyn. Um, so those are the things that sort of stand out to me that mean the most to me in this particular painting. Um, did you have any questions about that or? Yeah, well, I wanted to ask a little bit more about you know, I, I'm curious because these seem so personal and intimate. I'm curious when your friends come over 
or when people you know really well, how they react to these and how much, how much people read their own histories into these or, or do they see them as a reflection or portrait of you? How does that work? You know, it's interesting, Benjamin Tischer, who I work with, who's a curator and art dealer, um, said that he thought that these were like self-portraits, whereas a lot of my other, you know, portraits of torsos were portraits of other people. And in a way that's true. I mean, but I also think that people can project their own associations onto them. Like, like nobody would know that the sort of animal print behind the, that little figurine reminds me of my grandmother who loved animal prints and had like a hundred different kinds of <laughs> animal print outfits. Um, so, you know, whatever, I mean, things I would think about with these is, is I think about joy, I think about color, um, balancing elements and, and making it actually a functional altar too. There are certain things that an altar should have. Um, so, I just hope Do you mind explaining what those elements are for an altar? Okay, sure. Let's see. I'll go back. Um, there should be water present, preferably salt water. So in that bowl, you could have salt water in the, the foreground and then a candle for making fire. Um, so you're kind of representing all the different ele elements. Rocks represent the earth um, and the smoke from the fire too. Uh, is air. So it's just thinking about all the different elements and bringing them together. But also, I guess I'm thinking about materials and the makers and craftspeople and artists who make some of these objects and balancing those out. Like if there's something metal, how that feels as opposed to something made out of wood, if something's man-made or handmade. Um, yeah. You know, I've been thinking a lot about uh, in preparing for this. It was how how much of especially Western art history or altar paintings or paintings around altars. Do you know even like the Raphael at the Metropolitan Museum is an altar painting, right? And thinking about that, so it made me wonder: Do you consider these altar paintings of sorts, or are they just renderings of altars? And and what you know, and how do you sort of? interact with these? How do you see them? Where do you place them when you hang them? Like in, in your own home or your own space? I'd love to hear a little bit about that. I mean, I hope that they literally could function as sort of shrines for people. Not that they literally have to sit before it and light candles and although they could, but I, I, I hope that it just like as a painting brings that energy into someone's day, you know? And that's kind of how I think of them. Like I literally think of it as something that is ephemeral that I'm now preserving and now it can be transported and it can sort of provide that, that experience and activation to whoever looks at it in whatever form, you know, they receive it. So yeah, that is how, that is how I think about it actually. Um, so, so like when I'm thinking about how to set up an altar, I, I sort of, I actually recently have not I've done a few altar paintings that don't have every single element laid out or that don't even have a table in them. So that's kind of deviating a little bit from that rule. Um, but yeah. And yeah, how and often I do you change them? Because part of the, the appeal of them, appeal uh, for me of some of them is the fact that they feel like they're constantly shifting, right? But they're also like collapsible and could disappear. Yeah. And so do they migrate with you when you travel? Oh yeah, I mean, I have so many little objects that I've kept over the years that have kind of taken form in, in different altars wherever I live. And actually, Amy, uh, you told a story about how your roommate made an altar on a shelf when you were just in your first, I think in your first living apartment. situation. An adult, in the kitchen apartment. because we didn't cook. <laughs> oh, right, exactly. And she was interesting. She was, um, I lost touch with her, but she was a student at SVA and we shared our first, it was really like my first apartment in New York City. And uh, she was Cuban American. So she, you know, this was part of her tradition. Um, and actually she changed them quite regularly. Sometimes they were in the refrigerator. The kid, they would migrate. But um, I think that was why when I went to your exhibition, because we met via Harmony Hammond, because I actually was introduced to your work through your writing first. Um, and I saw the torsos and the altars together. 
um, my first thought was that the altars felt like bodies and the bodies like altars. And um, there is for me such a sense of inclusion in your, in your altars um, where there, there are all these personal narratives, objects that are really specific to your life. But then there's also these very generous um, elements to it that, like you were saying, are in a lot of shrines. So you can immediately, everyone can, has their own associations and their own experiences with shrines. And I think that that's what's so amazing about yours is they're so inclusive because I do have to say, you know, thinking about my friend's shrine, some of the elements, I really didn't know anything about why these objects were where, you know. And so it, it also piques people's curiosities. And I think when we go to the Aldrich paintings, you and I had a very long conversation about citation. And I, and I just, you know, and this bringing it back to kind of a feminist legacy, um, and maybe we, when we get to those works, we could talk more about that because that's another, they are, your work are, is very multi-layered. It's very non-hierarchical, but it's very generous in its sourcing. Yeah, and I do, I do think about like, you know, um, the fact that I'm painting pictures of things that other people may have made and how it is um, a way of creating an archive and citing, you know, citing that person, saying their name and creating a kind of history when often history doesn't record um, certain stories. So yeah, it's sort of a political act to do that in my mind. Um, but I just wanna say my first altar too, when I was just developing my spirituality was on a shelf. <laughs> it was just a little, a few little items on a shelf, yep. So it can be like, there's something about a small space that it, it feels like um, it's an autonomous creation. And even if it's small, your imagination can kind of make it large. Um, it also, I think, like, I mean, for those of us who are not, you know, following traditional religions, but have spiritual practices, it is a way of removing you from your own, like, it, it's a way of going deeper and creating a sense of intimacy in a very small space outside of, you know, you might be in your domestic space, but it's a way of leaving behind all of that, you know, and it's a way of just immediately being transported, which, um, you know, I think we see all the time in people in artist studios. And, and I, I mean, my workspace at the museum, which I am not there as often anymore, is filled mm. with images and objects and things that have been given to me from artists or things that I've received in the mail that I think are, are points of inspiration and, and are like a greater co constellation about influence and inspiration and also devotion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Clarity, I'd love you to talk a little bit about the, the role of the gaze. In mm. the, because I think this is where it's like that interior exterior and sort of like where it comes in. And I'm curious what, how you see these because the gaze seems to be something that's very important for you to be conscious of in your other work as well. Yeah. Well, I, you know, my Instagram handle is a lesbian gaze. So I do think about that. Um, and I, I want, but I do, it, like if you'll notice the tables are sort of in a perspective that um, is if you were looking right over top of them. And so um, I want them to feel inviting these paintings. Like I want anyone to feel invited. I don't want it to be like only certain people can come sit at this altar. Um, but that being said, I do kind of, um, find these as a place and everybody, you know, taste is subjective, right? Beauty is subjective. So these are the things that I love. These are the things that make me happy. Um, here's another one. This is called Starfish Altar. And, you know, um, there's a lot of meaning in this too. And uh, in terms of the gaze, I would say I've become more conscious recently thinking about sort of letting out my very femme aesthetic kind of unapologetically, like the colors I like, the textures and the like, you know, I like sparkly things, I like soft things. I like all these different kind of fun, almost evoking of childhood. Um, and uh, so I would say, 
you know, there's a, there's a sense of kind of reclaiming the gaze, uh, the male gaze. I mean, I'm also noticing those early still lives that you, uh, you chose to show in this, they're so masculine, you know, they're like, there's guns in them and there's, you know, they're, they're called things like a bachelor's this and that. So the, the gaze is very masculine. And I feel like this, my paintings are very much like um, about the things I love, but also knowing that the things I love are coming from my own personal experience with, with culture, like queer and lesbian subcultures. Also just thinking about like archives and feminist archives, um, like there's the Lesbian Herstory Archives in Brooklyn, which collects items of ephemera and other things that, that maybe wouldn't be recorded or would be lost. You know, so I do think about that, like um, trying to kind of make permanent things that could be forgotten uh, or overlooked. So um, like in this one, you know, there's the central object, which is, there's two of them, right? There's one on the top and one on the bottom, these kind of circular forms. Those are both pieces made by, they're part of one piece actually made by the artist Laurel Sparks. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it was really fun to get into detail and just paint something that she had made. And then to know that this was also kind of that she was part of this little cosmology um, of, of different artists. And, and on that little, that little heart that is, has a butterfly on it, the little green heart. When I was um, at McDowell, one of the residents, a writer, Jamie Rose Lowe, uh, gave one to everyone as she was leaving and put it in their mailbox. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was at Yaddo and um, the last night everybody got together and brought a little piece of material from their work and then we did this creative activity together and the, on the table you'll see this multicolored little ball which is actually like little bits of play-doh and then bits of fabric from Alana Herzog's work she brought some of her uh, fabric and textile um, the white sculpture on the table was made by my partner, Kate. Um, the painting on the table was made by me. Um, Pamela Council, the artist Pamela Council brought me the face, the pendant, um, when I had the show at Denny Dimon Gallery. And I was asking people to bring in things or take things from the altars that I had set up on the floor. Um, so yeah, it's a really fun, creative, um, activity of just like collecting things and sometimes not knowing why and then having things given to me by others um, and putting them all together. And Pamela Council's work is very much too about sort of joy and femme aesthetics. And so putting that little My Pretty Pony sticker above, above that was my way of sort of connecting. Um, and and this painting actually I recently finished this year and I call it Altar for LC. LC is Liz Collins, who is an amazing artist who works primarily in textiles. And there are several pieces in this. This is just like a patchwork of fabric, which was what I was envisioning. I wanted it almost to be like a quilt. Um, and the piece on the lower right that has these kind of circles of red and, and black uh, was designed by Liz and um, she gave me several of her fabric designs in case I wanted to use them in an altar. And then also the square on the upper left that is yellow striped with kind of peach color is also one of her designs. And then at the top, the, the sort of grid of um, brown with little red dots is also one of her pieces. And then, you know, I was also kind of thinking about her work and how inspired I have been by her use of color and pattern and queer community is really important in her work. So, um, so this altar is actually a kind of dedication to someone in my peer group, a fellow artist, um, and just thinking about color and pattern and the things I've always loved, like the pattern and decoration movement and the feminist art movement, um, and just kind of trying to kind of explore that, um, you know, in, in this work and still thinking of it as an altar, even though it doesn't have a little table in it. It's actually totally that kind of format that trompe l'oeil often is. It's that flat kind of um, thing that also Josephine Halverson, the painter often does as well, which I love. 
Um, so yeah, so this is very much like a very celebratory um, maximalist uh, expression here that I had a lot of fun with. Can you, can you speak a little bit about the shaped canvases just in general? Because I know the big heart is so prominent at the Altrich, but like even this, I'm seeing this sort of round rondelle. I'm kind of curious where you're, where that comes from and where, and is that always been an urge in your work? Not that I was aware of, but suddenly uh, it was. And then I, it just all happened. It was actually during the pandemic, strangely enough. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I've always loved, you know, works that weren't in a rectangle format, but um, I just decided to experiment. And I was working with Jeff Barron, who makes canvases. And um, I don't even remember how it came across that I was going to try different shapes, but I started doing different shapes. And then I was like, I've got to try them all. And he was joking with me and saying, okay, what's next? Are you going to do like a club? Like, are you going to do a, like a, a lucky four leaf clover? Like I, I was doing like, I did a diamond I, circles, hearts. Um, and, it, and it was really interesting to see how uh, my composition, I, my compositional ideas were influenced by the form. And in this case, I was definitely influenced by the, the circle. And, and also with, very you know, it's by cubism. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Amy. I was just no, going to no, say. No, sorry. Go, no, sorry. No, go ahead. Go I, ahead. I just was going to say it looks very influenced by cubism or like collage, even more so than the others. Is that conscious or is that something that you see as well? I, I like the idea of kind of getting lost in it spatially. I definitely, you know, I like that idea. That's what I was kind of hoping for, you know, uh, just kind of having some kind of vibrational experience looking at it. Mm. I was just thinking of, too with, ahead, the, sorry. with the shape, sorry, with the shaped canvases, you know, specifically this one in the heart, um, you know, in some of the other canvases that we've seen or the other altars, there's, there's a table present, but with the, some of these shaped canvases now, the table's been eliminated and, and you were telling me that you're really kind of using the wall and pinning things directly to the wall. And, and so that's, I think, why maybe the perspective looks so different, um, you, you know, cause you're working directly off the wall instead of having object three, you're not doing 2D to 3D, it's, it's more 2D, you know? Yeah. Um, but I love seeing this because I knew you were working on a circular painting, but this is the first time I've seen it finished. Yeah, this is the first time I've shared it with anybody. So it's really exciting to talk about it with you guys. Yeah. Well, I think, Amy, you brought up such an astute point that I think it makes me think now it's even more relevant where some of those older, older Trump Lloyd paintings often use tables as a way to separate the viewer from the audience, from the work in a way, or like create this illusionistic quality where clarity very much sort of tilts them up. So that intimacy and that accessibility and like generosity, and now you, you have you mentioned that the tables disappeared fully, where it sort of like feels even more immediate and close in a way, without the sort of like the marker of the table to separate us from the wall. Do you know? So I do think that was such a good observation, Amy. Oh, thank you so much. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm just enjoying this conversation so much. There's so much, so many interesting points. Um, but I also want you to have a chance, yay, to talk <laughs> about the work, the works that I think some of our audience has probably seen in person. Um, and I want to stress that even though um, we're talking about Trump Loy and maybe you, things that look hyper realistic on the screen, you still need to see these pieces up close and in person um, because the scale shifts and um, the sensuality of the way that you work with paint is just gorgeous. Um, and here also we have another shape. Yes, and of course the triangle, the pink triangle was is a shape that has gr great resonance for me. Um, I grew up in Washington DC from when I was 10 on and we lived kind of near DuPont Circle and that was a very gay area. And I remember I was in high school when the first march, the gay march on Washington happened. I think it was 1987 or 80, I think it was 1987. And DuPont Circle was just overrun by androgynous people. To my teenage eyes, 
androgynous people wearing pink triangles. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, it was amazing. And so the pink triangle was uh, from a young age, you know, really for me. And it was, it was the time of the AIDS crisis. And so it was silence equals death and also the, the triangle. Um, it was all kind of sort of melded together in this kind of bittersweet, um, you know, experience of like love and also death and loss. And um, so I was thinking about all that when uh, I made this and I thought about like really kind of feming, feminizing in a way that that pink triangle with just with just everything femme. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so there's a there's a button in it that's the trans flag button. Um, there's a little piece of my palette paper. There's some wonderful pink and gray suspenders that I found. Um, and I made the central thing out of like um, beads and um, self-hardening red clay. Um, a, a good friend in, um, who I've known for many, many years used to always send me Valentines and that star on the wall, I cut out from one of her homemade Valentines. It has glitter around the edges. Um, you can see a close up here. And then the femme, that's a, that's a tattoo that um, I had a photograph of, somebody's tattoo that says femme. Um, and then the little motorcycle I found, um, the family that used to live in the house we live in has um, the daughter who's now kind of close to our age. Um, this must have been her toy. And I texted her a picture of it and she said, yep, that, that's gotta be mine. So I loved that it happened to be pink. And we had talked, Amy and I, about the color pink because before COVID, Amy was going to uh, curate a show about the color pink. So I was sort of just thinking about pink. Um, so all of this stuff was kind of going on in my mind. And I, I have a, a very good friend who's a writer, who's a gay man, who has a lot of feminine energy, who was visiting and when I was thinking about the title for this, well, he was delighted by it in that kind of femme way that femmes can have. And um, and I said, should I call it pink altar or should I call it altar for femme joy? Is that too much? And he was like, no, altar for femme joy, altar for femme joy. So I really, really mean it when I say like, this is not about biological girliness or anything. It is, it is about femme energy that we all have access to. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a lot about childhood maybe in this as well. So how much of these altars are, are shared for you, Clarity? And how much of them are mostly for you, yourself and perhaps your partner? Oh, I would say they're all shared. Yeah, definitely. Like I'm thinking about, like, I want them to be relevant for others and inviting. Sounds and this good. is, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say here, the tables disappeared again. Yeah, the table disappeared again. This is birth altar 2020 to 2021, which is significant because that year was the year of, of the beginning of this pandemic. And in this painting, you see uh, a Judy Chicago face mask that she designed called the butterfly mask hanging on the wall. And you see also a Judy Chicago dinner plate and a necklace with three hearts that I just bought because I liked it. And then two other images from artists, uh, Louise Bourgeois drawing and in Anna Mendieta earthwork. And then photographs of birth that I found online. Um, and I'll show you a close up here. Um, the Louise Bourgeois drawing has someone giving birth through their mouth. So I think about birth in this in all kinds of ways, you know, conceptually. Um, I think of it as, as something that is, can be queer, um, that can be trans, um, and not necessarily tied to the idea of motherhood. Although I also think of um, just the idea of, you know, feminist art that has portrayed the vagina and how sort of controversial that has been and also how kind of cliche that has been. But then my interest in doing that in such a way that um, shows an aspect of what the vagina can do that is only just now being able, be, being sort of seen by mm -hmm. 
by people. There's a whole Instagram community that's all about birth. That's always, they're always posting videos. There've also been some um, contemporary art examples of birth lately. Um, Heji Shin had some pieces in the Whitney Biennial a few years ago and Carmen Winant also did a whole, huge birth collage. Mm -hmm. um, so I've just, and, but I, had, I haven't seen a lot of paintings about birth. And I think about Gustave Courbet's Origin of the World and how it implies crowning. Um, and I think about Micheline Thomas's um, Origin of the Universe, which replaces Courbet's white body with a black body. And it's very glittery also and subversive in that way. Um, so yeah, I'm just really interested in representing birth in paint and, and crowning and um, seeing how those meanings can be expanded and experienced by the different people in different ways. So these are the two pieces together, which I never would have thought of. <laughs> I, I just happened to have these two pink paintings and Amy came to my studio and this is what I love about the, the creative aspect of collaborating with a curator. I never would have thought of putting these two pieces together, but of course it makes sense. They have so much in common. And um, I think Amy, in a way by, taking these two pink things and come, bringing them together and in that way almost increasing their pink power, you almost did what I would have considered almost forbidden. Like that's too much. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, that's, that's going too far with the pink, you know? Um, but it's really, yeah, it's, I, I just love that. But you, you kind of created a new meaning uh, through the way you present the work. Well, I, you know, I was, I was thinking about these two paintings when I saw them in the studio. I remember we were having a dialogue about pink because of this exhibition I was, I, I am still working on um, and really is about pink's persistent politicization and the way that it's used. Um, it's been reclaimed as a symbol of power um, and also in, inclusion, but it also, people have very emotional relationships to the color. Um, and I think, you know, when I went to the Women's March in 2017, I, I was thinking about the color. And then when I saw the pink pussy hat, it all came back to me why this color for me is a symbol of protest. Um, but it was also, I remember as, as a young girl, an oppressive color. So it's, you know, it has this kind of um, this kind of ongoing tension, I think that we have that for me is the only color that does that. I mean, I don't feel that way about blue. I don't feel that way about red or yellow. Um, I think really think about it as pink and also in history, its meaning has shifted so much. And in my own personal life, it has. And I think I was so interested in these two paintings and showing them together, first of all, because they were made during the pandemic. And I think that there's an element to them that is your experience, your way of experiencing the pandemic and what creatively. Um, and then also because I kind of think of Alter for Femme Joy um, more perhaps as your as a continuation of your own self-portrait or your own creative journey. And then Birth Alter to me is really about the creative journey I think that artists take. And like you were saying, you're citing your, your mothers, your artistic mothers. And, um, but also I, I know that um, on your Instagram account um, that you've dealt with a lot of censorship. And I think um, as a feminist and also I, I consider myself also a feminist curator, I, I felt like what is more, what is the most important thing to be showing right now at this moment. And um, for some reason, the, the female body, especially um, the act of birth is, is still censored. And, and why is that? And I think putting it in the museum on the prominent art wall um, and you know making us aware um, that this is just the natural, our, our bodies and why are women's bodies still politicized, you know? Um, and that was something I think that 
this, the, why these two works to me were really important to show together because they're both dealing with um, highly political choice, issues of choice and issues of censorship and taboo, but also joy and healing and inclusion all at the same time. So there's lots of entry points. Um, and, uh, and I like that the two, the colors, the two color pinks, the shades are different. One is cooler, the other is warmer. One is more, to me, more bodily. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that you're, that you were, I think you were surprised when, <laughs> when I made that choice. And you just reminded me, I forgot to mention this, but the, my favorite painting of birth and the only one I can really think of is Frida Kahlo's painting, yeah. My Birth. And actually this, this um, image uh, mm -hmm. photograph at the top reminds me of it. Um, it's such a great painting and she's, you know, Frida Kahlo never shied away from showing blood. Um, and it's, it's, it's wonderful, that painting. And so um, I think that I'm referencing that painting, at least to myself with that photograph. Um, but yeah, I love, I love what you just said about both of these. They both are in their own way, kind of almost like proclaiming something. They're almost like flags or something. And love, I feel like in this period that we've been coming out of, or we're still in, but especially like, you know, our, the political climate, to me, like, is so radical. I mean, we're finding it, that's really, it, you know, this kind of, what you're, the, what, what you're doing in these paintings is, is radical. And the, our messaging right now, if we can be inclusive and love each other, I mean, really, ultimately, perhaps it's the way out <laughs> of the, uh, right. um, and, and we, and we the, get a lot of toxic masculinity yeah. going on. Yeah. And I love, I love that you brought up uh, earlier clarity, the citation as feminist practice and sort of how many people sort of see it that way. And, uh, but part of it that just came up in this later part of the conversation I wanted to ask you about is how much has the internet censorship impacted like have the like in terms of when you create these images have they impacted anything in the way you sort of uh, organize your images um, and do you think about that at all I mean we I hate to think it sort of creeps into your studio but I also want to ask you about that if that is well, something I, mean, I, I almost think I came across the Instagram birth community because they were a censored group Mm -hmm. and, and because I was involved in the fight against censor censorship, I became aware of different hashtags like stop censoring women, stop censoring birth. And, um, and then I found all these accounts that show um, images and videos of birth and they won their, their fight with Instagram. And now they are allowed to show um, completely graphic uh, images and videos of birth. Um, which is actually kind of ironic that it's easier to do that than to show like a nipple that is considered to belong to a, a quote unquote female body. That's still too much, but we can see, you know, birth. Um, but yeah, I, I think um, I definitely have thought about that. And, you know, I don't know which comes first, the chicken or the egg, but my involvement with the figure and depicting the figure before this has been also about cropping and mm. showing a certain part of the body in a very um, deliberate way that has some element of refusal um, in, in the sense that you're not being shown everything. Um, and in some ways it is for some reason regarded as um, taboo. So, and, and so in a way this feels like familiar territory because it's similar and I do think there's a power to um, the visual look of birth that is really, I mean, I've even thought like, does the, the myth of Medusa come from <laughs> the idea of crowning? Because it's like, if you look at it, you'll turn to stone and you know, all the snakes and the hair are almost like the umbilical cord and, and all the like different fluids coming out. I mean, it's like so chaotic and so um, beautiful, but also in some ways for many scary. And then with the pandemic, you know, that was scary, speaking of scary, and with all the death of the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, and I know we all lost people, 
thinking about death and the connection that it has with birth, I think, I think that's where birth started coming out too for me during that year in the sense that both death and birth are removed from everyday life. They're scary, they're beautiful, they're transformative. Um, they can be, you know, um, you know, involving a lot of difficult bodily <laughs> realities, um, but there's something really sacred too about them both. So, you know, there's, there's death doulas just like there are birth doulas. And um, so I think I was kind of in some way thinking about all the death that was happening and, and expressing birth as the kind of flip side of it. And the birth painting seems to be the most sparse out of this series mm. of, of altars. Is there a reason for that? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I remember I had, I had Brenda Goodman into my studio and she was, she's a, incredible when it comes to composition. And she was just like, ah, oh, this shouldn't get too crowded. Like, I really like all the space. Um, so I think I just decided like, maybe it's with, with images that are so kind of considered too, and they're very narrative, like not needing to have a lot of other things and letting the negative space function maybe as a kind of skin or body. Mm. I love that because it feels very different from the others in that also there is an attendancy for symmetry that some of your altars tend to have. And this one seems to sort of avoid that consciously, um, even yeah. though the shape itself obviously would lend itself to that. Right, right, exactly. Well, that's one of the fun things about working with the shapes, I think, is just sort of thinking about composition in different ways. Because I usually tend to think of an altar as being pretty symmetrical. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Um, but also the body you can think of that way. And I've, you know, when I, when I sit across from someone to do a torso portrait, it's very much like we're uh, facing each other and the window is perpendicular and, you know, there's this kind of lining up. And then I think about just like the chakras of the torso and everything on a very kind of no. vertical, kind of vertical plane. So yeah, that's interesting. Absolutely. Well, I think we're just about at an hour. So um, this was so, so amazing to have both of you here. Thank you so much for being so generous with your, your creativity and your thoughts and your ideas. And I hope we can do this again, um, maybe in person one day. Um, but thank you so much um, for um, being here today. And I hope to see you both in person soon. Thank you so much to you both. I really appreciate it. And everyone for coming as well. Absolute pleasure to be part of this. Thank you, both of you and everyone involved. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.